Merry Christmas everyone. Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. But today is not a regular day. Today is Christmas Sunday and Christmas Eve all rolled into one. And tomorrow, if you can believe it, is Christmas Day 2023. Another year will soon be behind us. And another year, a brand new year, is looming large right in front of us. Matter of fact, next week will be the first day of 2024. But at any rate, we're finishing up this year's Christmas series, Jesus, the reason for the season. And this is the very last message in this series entitled, Jesus, the Spirit of Christmas. For our text, we're going to read the real Christmas story found in Luke chapter two. So if you would, please turn with me to Luke chapter 2. We're going to read verse 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the end. This portion of scripture starts out in those days. But in which days? The days concerning the birth of Jesus the Christ, the promised Messiah. Let me give you some background facts on how in complete control God is of everything that happens on earth. There's nothing that happens on earth that is outside of God's control. Jesus' mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph, who was from the house and lineage of King David. It so happened that Mary would be pregnant at the very same time of the census that would force them to be in Bethlehem. Not only would she be pregnant, mind you, but to the point of giving birth. They could not wait for the child to be born back in Nazareth because of the importance or the urgency of the emperor's edict. Each person had to go to his own hometown to be registered. So, Joseph had to travel with his pregnant wife to the town of Nazareth in Galilee, to Bethlehem in Judea, also known as the city of David, because of the census that the Caesar, Caesar Augustus, decreed, and Mary, as his lawful wife, went along with him. Caesar Augustus, born Gaius Octavius, also known as Octavian, became the first emperor of the Roman Empire when his great uncle and adopted father, Julius Caesar, was assassinated in 44 BC. The Roman Empire was far flung. It was a huge empire and the government needed a lot of money in order to operate it. They, they needed a huge amount of money to upkeep this vast empire, to build infrastructure, to build roads and other buildings and that sort of thing. Money was needed to fund the army in order to protect this vast empire. Not to mention the upkeep of Caesar's extravagant and luxurious lifestyle. The bottom line is, the empire needed money. And the best way to raise that kind of money was through taxes. So Caesar Augustus decreed that a census was to be taken, which required everyone to go to his own ancestral hometown or his own ancestral city to be registered for tax purposes. Unwittingly, Caesar's decree would fulfill an ancient prophecy by Micah concerning the promised Messiah. Micah chapter 5 verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. 
if Caesar had not issued the decree, Mary and Joseph would not have a reason to travel to Bethlehem. They would have no need to be in Bethlehem at that time when she was about to give birth. Sure, the decree was inconvenient to the people. Everyone had to take off work and they had to pack up the family. They had to travel to their ancestral hometown in order to register, but it was necessary. That was to say, most people was probably outraged by it, but they had no choice but to comply. Mary and Joseph was no different. Mary, for goodness sake, was pregnant, almost ready to deliver. It was not a convenient time for her. In fact, she was so far along that when she got to Bethlehem, she was ready to deliver baby Jesus. But there was no room for them in the end. And there is where we will pick up our story this morning. Mary and Joseph embarked on a four to five day journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem on foot. It's very plausible also that Mary and Joseph traveled along with other people. Maybe they traveled in a big group because everyone was in the same plight. They were trying to get to Bethlehem in time for this registration to register for the census. And traveling in big groups gave them protection, gave them company, and traveling was much safer. Then we must also consider that if Mary was that far along, it would probably have taken them even longer than the customary four or five days because Mary had to walk a little bit slower than usual. She probably had to make more frequent stops than usual because baby Jesus was probably pressing heavily now on her bladder. But it all boils down to the fact that it was essential for Mary and Joseph to be in the city of David at the right time so that Jesus might be born there to fulfill that ancient prophecy. Who else but God could orchestrate all of that? Here's the other thing. I know there's paintings and Christmas cards and even movies depicting Mary riding to Bethlehem on a donkey. But the reality is she was probably too far along in her pregnancy to ride a donkey. Even at seven months, it would still be very difficult for her to do that. But she probably was farther along in her pregnancy than seven months. Because the scripture tells us while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And all of that walking only helped to dilate Mary and to bring down or to bring about the birth of baby Jesus faster. Or at the very least, to bring about the birth of Jesus on time. Therefore, Mary had to be far enough along in her pregnancy to have given birth very soon after her arrival in Bethlehem. Then they moved from Migdal Eder into a house according to Matthew chapter 2 verse 11. I want you to look at this. It's a chain of events that Luke describes. We're going to read Luke chapter 2 verse 21 through 24. Then we're going to skip down to verse 39 through 40. Starting at verse 21. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. First, it says, when everything was performed, according to the law of the Lord, would also include all of the prophecies concerning the Messiah, including them going to Egypt to prevent Herod from finding baby Jesus and killing him. Now, circumcision day and the days of purification are two separate events. Matter of fact, circumcision day was the beginning 
of the days of purification according to the Levitical law found in Leviticus chapter 12 verse 4. Let me break it down for you. Jesus was circumcised and officially named on the eighth day in accordance with Leviticus chapter 12 which teaches about purification after childbirth. Look at Leviticus chapter 12 verse 3. And on the eighth day the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. And so on the eighth day according to that law Jesus was circumcised still being in Migdal Eder the place of his birth because Mary would still be unclean until the eighth day. Look at Leviticus chapter 12 verse 2. If a woman conceives and bears a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days, and at the time of her menstruation, she shall be unclean. Therefore, her uncleanness after giving birth to a male child will be the same as her menstruation. Therefore, on the eighth day, when they circumcised baby Jesus, Mary was no longer unclean and could now enter a family member's home without causing the house or that home and those who lived there who would come in contact with her to become unclean themselves. Look at Leviticus chapter 15 verse 19 through 23. When a woman has a discharge and the discharge in her body is blood, she shall be in her menstrual impurity for seven days and whoever touches her shall be unclean until the evening. And everything on which she lies during her menstrual impurity shall be unclean. Everything also on which she sits shall be unclean. And whoever touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And whoever touches anything on which she sits shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. Whether it is the bed or anything on which she sits, when he touches it, he shall be unclean until the evening. So it is highly unlikely that they would invite or be invited into anyone's home until the days of her uncleanness was over, which would be on the eighth day. Now, according to the Levitical law, Leviticus chapter 12, Mary would still be in a purifying state 33 days after giving birth, but in this 33 days of purification, she would be clean. But watch this. Continuing from verse 3, where we left off, I want to pick it up in verse 4. Then she shall continue for 33 days in the blood of her purifying. She shall not touch anything holy, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying are complete. See, Mary was clean, but she still could not come into the temple until after the 33 days. Therefore, Jesus was not taken to the sanctuary on the eighth day, but the circumcisers came to where he was. Just like they came to John the Baptist at his circumcision, which is found in Luke chapter 1, verse 59. Then after her 33 days of purification period, they went to the temple in Jerusalem to present the offerings prescribed in the book of the law, but remained in Bethlehem to fulfill the prophecy spoken of by the prophet Jeremiah. Matthew chapter 2, verse 18. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel, weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because there are no more. This was fulfilled when Herod the king ordered all the male children in Bethlehem, two years old and younger, to be killed. Even with all of that, Jesus' parents did not know it then, but their baby boy, Lord Jesus, would usher in what is now known to us as the most wonderful time of the year. Now, just because Santa Claus is a big deal at Christmas, many Christians want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. What I mean is this, just because Santa Claus, his elves, and the North Pole try to take center stage in secular celebrations, some Christians want to condemn the celebrations altogether. They lump it in with celebrations such as Halloween, which has nothing to do 
with Christianity has nothing to do with Jesus at all. But consider this. King Charles III of England, his actual birthday, the date that he was born, is November the 14th. But it is officially celebrated in June. And the English people have no problem with that. Likewise, his mother, the late Queen Elizabeth II, observed her birthday in June as well. But her actual date of birth was April the 21st. And they still didn't have a problem with that. So what I'm saying to you is don't get caught up on the date. Don't get caught up on the commercialization of Christmas. Don't get caught up on Santa Claus. Don't get caught up on his reindeer. Don't get caught up on the owls. Let us celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, with joy, with peace, with celebrations. We don't get caught up on the Easter Bunny, do we? We don't get caught up on the commercialization of the amount of chocolate that is being sold during Easter time, do we? No, we don't. We focus on the death and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we celebrate Easter, remembering the price that was paid for us, the price that Jesus paid when he hung on a cross. That is what Easter is all about. That is what we remember. See, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, he ushered in the spirit of Christmas. Now, people are trying their best to kill the spirit of Christmas at least to smother the spirit of Christmas by condemning those who want to celebrate it. Or they try to guilt those who are celebrating it into stopping the celebrations. But Jesus is the very spirit of Christmas. So what is the spirit of Christmas? Well, in the islands, Christmas is filled with peace, with joy, and with good cheer. Even those you haven't been getting along with all year are friendly towards each other during this time of celebration, during Christmas season. Lots and lots of good cooking goes on during this time. Lots of different cakes are being baked. Sweet sweets are being baked. Christmas trees are in every house and decorations fill the air. Christmas carols are being sung. People are joyous, they're happy. And everyone, at least almost everyone, attends at least one Christmas service. Even if they haven't been to church all year, they go because they just can't miss their children. They just can't miss their grandchildren's Christmas programs, either at church or at school. They have to see their little ones performing and take out the camcorder and record it, take the flash pictures. See, in days gone by, back in the islands, the men would go down to the beach and they, they would dig down into the sand to make sure that they find the whitest, purest sand and they would sift it, get in that pure white sand and they would take it home and they would spread it out in their front yards. And everybody would be doing this. They would get out their rakes and they would rake their yards and their yards would be looking so beautiful white sand and all raked nicely and you better not walk through that raked yard if you know what was good for you. These days most people have lawns and they have no need for this beach sand to be spread out in the yard so that tradition has gone by the way. But nevertheless I suppose those things can be considered the spirit of Christmas in the islands. It's just something about Christmas. The food, the shopping, the business, the fireworks, the cooler temperatures, the charitable nature of people at this time of the year. It's the spirit of Christmas. As kids, we could get away with a little bit more than we could throughout the rest of the year. For whatever reason, people, parents, even teachers were willing to overlook things that they probably would not have let slide at any other time of the year. They were willing to let it slide at this time of the year, Christmas season. Why? Because I believe it is the spirit of Christmas. So with that said, I suppose the spirit of Christmas would include forgiveness, peace, joy, giving, the generosity of people's heart. Overlooking things that they wouldn't overlook at any other time. 
kindness, charity, love. You can just feel it in the air. There is a distinct change in the air when Christmas season rolls in. And see, Jesus encompasses all of those traits. That's why he can be considered the spirit of Christmas. Saying Merry Christmas invokes the spirit of Christmas. It brings a warm, fuzzy feeling deep inside. It demands that all of those tributes or all of those attributes we just listed above are acted upon. And maybe that's the reason why so many people try to cancel Christmas and try to take Christ out of Christmas. But without Jesus Christ, there is no Christmas. His name says it all. The word Christmas encompasses his name, Christ Christmas. But in our lukewarm post-Christian society, we want to take Christ out of everything, including Christmas. We want to call it anything except Christmas. We want to say Xmas, holiday season, even winter celebrations, but not Christmas. But I want to tell you something. Without Jesus, without Christ, there is no Christmas spirit. Have you noticed it's almost like an obligation this time of the year to, to bring these attributes into fruition? Yes, some people take it, take advantage of it. Yes, some people take it too far. Others don't take it far enough. But either way, we are celebrating Jesus. Look at the Feast of Dedication, the Jewish Feast of Dedication. It's a feast not appointed in Torah, yet it is observed every year on the 25th day of the Jewish month, Kislev. Since 138 BC, they've been celebrating this festival or this feast. Even Jesus is recorded attending this feast in John chapter 10, verse 22 through 23. Likewise, the Feast of Purim was instituted by Mordecai even earlier than that. Look, Esther chapter 9, verse 19. It says, That is why rural Jews, those living in villages, observe the 14th of the day of Adar as a day of joy and feasting, a day for giving what presents to each other. And that's what we're doing. We're celebrating like that. We're giving presents to each other. We're, we're enjoying feasting. We're enjoying good food. We're, we're spreading joy. We're spreading peace. That is what we do at Christmas. It's a day of joy, a feast, of giving presents to each other. And so why should we not celebrate Christmas like the Jews celebrate their feast, Purim, and a day of, of, of dedication, the Feast of Dedication? Let me tell you, Christmas is about Christ. It's about Jesus. It's celebrating his birth. It doesn't matter what day he was actually born on. What we're doing is celebrating Jesus. So don't let people try to trick you or try to, to, to embarrass you or try to con you into not celebrating Christmas. They just want to take Christ out of the celebrations. Understand this. We are celebrating something even greater than what they're celebrating. We're celebrating the saving of eternal souls by the birth of Jesus, who, being God, came down in human flesh to die for each one of us so that whomsoever will can come and can receive eternal life. See, God gave his son, the spirit of Christmas, Jesus Christ, so that the world might be saved through him. How can we not help but celebrate that? Even if the world does not accept him, even if the world does not accept his salvation, I ask you again, how can we not celebrate the birth of something so magnificent, so significant, so great as the birth of Jesus? See, the birth of Jesus 
is God coming in the flesh to redeem mankind. But see, this free gift of God is a free gift of life. It was ushered in by the birth of Jesus, his death and his resurrection. But it is not pushed on anyone, even though it's free. It's not thrust upon you. But anyone can receive it. But understand this as well. No one is held captive by it. In other words, if you want it, it is yours to have. All you have to do is accept it. But how can I accept it, someone might ask. You accept it by accepting Jesus in your heart. And you do that by praying a simple prayer and believing that Jesus is who he said that he is. And if you want to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior this Christmas, all you got to do is to ask. All you got to do is to repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, forgive me. I have sinned. And I come to you now this Christmas to ask for forgiveness and to receive your free gift of life. I accept it now and I ask you to help me to live for you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. The next step now is buy a Bible or get your Bible off the shelf if you already have one. Open it up and begin to read it. Begin to read every word that's in there. You can start in the New Testament. You can start in the book of John. Just start reading. But read the whole Bible. Learn what's in there. Let God speak to you while reading His Word. Learn His Word. Highlight those promises that, that He has made to you. Those things that resonate with you. That when you're tempted, when you're down, when, when you're out, when you're feeling that you can't make it, recall those verses. Recall the Word of God. And those words will help you through whatever you're going through. God is faithful. He will not leave you like an orphan. He will come to you. For He has given us His Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in each one of us. Jesus loves you. He will not leave you. He's always with you. Lo, I'm with you always. Next thing I want you to do is to find a Bible-believing church. One that believes a right way to live and a wrong way to live. Not one of those progressive churches who believe you can live however you want, that accepts the things of the world and that's a friend to the world. Remember, a friend of the world is being at enmity with God. You cannot be a friend of the world and be a friend of God at the same time. When we are a friend of God, we cut off the world. Not that we try to live outside the world, we try to live, think that we're better than the world. No, we love the world, but we don't live as the world lives. We live as Jesus expects us to live and how he will judge us when he comes back. So be discipled in a church like that. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. And he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And that's the words that every Christian wants to hear. But when you hear those words, it's all over. You have made it in. There's no more struggle, no more worries, no more heartaches. You are home. You have now received your reward. Jesus has great things planned for us throughout all eternity. But those who reject him will only have a lake of fire and eternal punishment to look forward to. You don't have to go through that. And those who have said that prayer, who has accepted Jesus, they will not go through that. For Jesus is faithful and he will save them. I want to say again, Merry, Merry Christmas. The Lord bless you richly. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.